This episode is brought to you by my Fertility Awareness Mastery online self-study program. Learn fertility awareness from the comfort of your own home at your own pace for a fraction of the cost. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash mastery for details. That's fertilityfriday.com slash mastery. This is the Fertility Friday podcast, episode number 284. Welcome to the Fertility Friday Podcast, your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I'm your host, Lisa Hendrickson-Jack. I'm the author of The Fifth Vital Sign and the Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Journal. I'm a certified fertility awareness educator and holistic reproductive health practitioner with nearly 20 years of experience teaching women to connect to their fifth vital sign through menstrual cycle charting, balancing hormonal health, and optimizing the menstrual cycle without hormones. I'm outspoken about hormonal birth control and its impact on fertility and overall health because you have the right to know how your body works and how artificial hormones disrupt that natural process. I host live coaching programs to help you achieve optimal fertility and health because it's important to have healthy menstrual cycles regardless of whether or not you want to have babies. I'm also a wife and mother of two beautiful boys. I know, I know, I'm a busy girl, but I manage to fit it all in. This podcast is designed to empower you to take full control of your cycles, your fertility, and your overall health. And I'm so excited that you're here with us today. I'm excited to share today's interview with you. In today's interview, I have invited back both Dr. Rosie Darvigo and Donna Zubrod to the podcast. For those of you who have been listening to the podcast for a while, you'll know that I've interviewed Dr. Rosita Arvigo before back in episode 18. So she was actually one of my very first guests on the podcast. And since then, I've interviewed a number of Arvigo practitioners and also interviewed practitioners of other abdominal therapy modalities. And if you are a regular listener to the podcast, you'll know that uh, abdominal therapy modalities are something that I talk about regularly as one of the ways that we can, as women, address various period-related issues. So in last week's podcast episode, It was all about period pain, and I shared how abdominal massage therapies have helped women to uh, remove adhesions and to uh, help the uterus to become in better alignment, improve blood flow, and ultimately reduce uh, painful symptoms. And what I really appreciate, I always talk about it, but what I really appreciate about abdominal therapy modalities is that you're addressing the physical nature of the body because I feel that we're often really detached from it. We think that if we have pain in the abdominal area that it we don't think necessarily that we could need some sort of abdominal therapy that would actually physically address that area. We often think that we need to change diet and and take supplements, which isn't necessarily untrue. (laughs) There are a number of different ways to approach different challenges, but I feel that we often just discount the physical nature of it. So I'm sure that you will appreciate today's episode. I'm excited to hear what you think about it. So without further ado, let's jump into it. And I'm really excited to have them both on the show. I interviewed both guests in previous episodes, so I will make sure to link those episodes in the show notes page. If you haven't listened to episode number 18 with Dr. Rosita Arvigo, I would highly recommend that you head over and listen to that episode after this one. Dr. Rosita Arvigo is a doctor of nephropathy, an anthobotanist, spiritual healer. She's the author of eight books on traditional healing of Central America And she's the founder of the Arvigo Techniques of Maya Abdominal Therapy and the Arvigo Institute. Donna Zubrod is a nationally certified North Carolina licensed massage and bodywork therapist. She is a DONA, Donna Certified Birth Doula, and a certified practitioner and teacher of the Arvigo Techniques of Maya Abdominal Therapy. And her practice, Seven Generations Massage and Birth, offers support towards positive reproductive and digestive health experiences and outcomes from menarche through childbearing years to menopause and beyond. And in today's episode, one of the topics that we'll be talking about is your recent observational study, which I I think it's really fascinating, a study where you actually measured some of the effects of Arvigo therapy on the menstrual cycle parameters. So I know our listeners will be really excited to hear about that. So maybe we can start there and then you can tell us just a little bit about what prompted you to do it. What is an observational study and just kind of get our our feet wet and our understanding about what, what prompted you to do this? So 
As part of becoming an, an advanced teacher with the RVGO Institute, we're required to, to do an observa a clinical observational study on a particular topic. And for some time now, whenever a, a client approaches you about your work, they say, you know, what's the evidence? What's the research say? And it's very difficult in the when you're dealing with natural healing modalities to have a, uh, because there's so many variables that are involved in the healing process in the body and to be able to isolate them and to study certain um, parameters and to remove all bias and to introduce a lot of randomization to adhere to that gold standard research is very difficult. But anyway, I tried to see if I could do a, a, like a pilot study to see if it warranted further in, in investigation. So that's what I did. And often the, the topic is, can abdominal pelvic massage um, inc improve your time to conception? Can it help you get pregnant? And, you know, I always learned from Rosita that, no, we don't discuss it that way. And the second prize is conception. So that's where always the focus is. So then I started to look at this even further and to say, well, then I want to change, change the story, change the game. It is not going to be, does abdominal therapy help you get pregnant faster? <laughs> it's like, how does it improve your health? And let's see if I can focus on some parameters that are, that are known to be important for, for, to, for conception. So, mm -hmm. for example good quality and ample amounts of cervical mucus is an example, right? And that's what I really, you know, focused on. What are some of the specifics that you'd like to hear about the study, Lisa? Uh, well, before we dive into that, I mean, a, a lot of mm -hmm. my listeners are familiar with abdominal therapy modalities uh, mm -hmm. because I've done several episodes on our Vigo mm -hmm. specifically, as well as other abdominal therapy mm -hmm. modalities. I mean, again, the listeners can always go back and listen to the previous right. episodes, but just think about those listeners who maybe this is the first time they've heard of our Vigo. Also, there are a lot of women who are skeptical. The more that I talk about our Vigo therapy and pelvic uh, abdominal therapy and also vaginal steaming, the more people come out the woodwork. You know, what is this? Where's the evidence? Is it dangerous? All of those types of things. So I'm not sure if uh, Dr. Arvigo, if you'd like to talk, just tell us a little bit about what the therapy, you know, is and just kind of, I know it's hard to be brief about something like that, but just give us some information for the listeners for whom this is new information. All right. Well, myoabdominal therapy addresses the entire abdomen, all of the arteries, the veins, the lymph flow, the nerve innervation, and chi as well. So we start in the upper abdomen, just under the rib cage, with our massage to ensure that the diaphragm muscle, which is the seat of all anxiety and tension in every human being, because we're all under some element of stress, the diaphragm muscle often tightens around the, the descending thoracic artery that lets blood supply flow downward. So that's the first place we begin is loosen that diaphragm muscle to ensure that good supply of red blood, which carries nutrients, oxygen, hormones, make sure, first of all, that's getting to the abdominal digestive organs. And then we move further, coming down um, from the pubic bone upwards to see if the uterus has shifted out of its primary position. Our work is all external. We have uh, very good success with, uh, with the uh, uterus if it has moved forward, downward, side to side. Those, those uteri that are posterior or leaning backwards, we have very special techniques for those. So that's our basic approach. Number one, to ensure that the entire abdominal region, which is really the other than the brain and the heart and the lungs, that's everything in the body. The rest is muscles and bones. Mm -hmm. So we want to ensure that all the digestive organs have arterial blood supply, venous drainage, which carries away the waste material, deoxygenated blood, 
and then the lymphatic flow is moving in Mm -hmm. and out, that the nerves are working and functioning properly from the spinal column and the sacrum. So our work is both on the front and the back. And then, of course, the uh, energy flow, the chi, which in Maya is known as chulel. So if that's a nutshell, that's my nutshell. Mm -hmm. Well, and so this is body work. So this involves... It's body work. And yeah, and our goal is simply simply to uh, focus on uh, normalcy. We like to focus on homeostasis, which is balance within the body, and hemodynamics, which is unimpeded flow of blood in the body. Mm -hmm. And central to our to our work is that we teach our clients self-care because, you know, healing doesn't happen in in one session. And it's the little things that we do every day on a on a regular basis that are going to promote our healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And let me just interject that Donna's study was uh, small, but extremely well done on uh, 10 clients, uh, nine of whom completed the study. And there, there was clear evidence that the uh, cervical fluid was improved and had more days to be present. And then also that the luteal phase is so, that is so important to uh, hold and to achieve pregnancy was also lengthened. We know, and you know from all of the studies and work that you've done on this podcast and your own book that's recent, that uh, the uh, days of the uh, luteal phase when progesterone is active in the body is extremely important to maintain pregnancy. In my own practice in Belize, one of the primary factors was that women were often getting pregnant, but if they had a 9, 10, or 11-day luteal phase, the progesterone flow was insufficient. Often with the abdominal massage, moving upward and just the way we, it's difficult to describe verbally, but with the um, pelvic massage, we are able to stimulate ovaries to do a better job of manufacturing progesterone. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the reasons that those two biomarkers were so improved with Donna's nine clients. Well, I just want to so I just want to kind of open up a part of the conversation around, because this is a very different approach than our traditional medical system. And so a lot of women find themselves struggling with whether it's issues with their periods, issues with their cycles, issues trying to conceive. And so in our kind of paradigm, the most common paradigm, the thought is that we need to take medication, we need to (laughs) <laughs> regulate the cycle with the pill and all of those types of things. And I get a lot of pushback because I'm very outspoken about the pill. I get a lot of pushback, especially from women who have very difficult periods. So for example, in the case of severe endometriosis, where there's a lot of pain, and often women are being told that the only way to treat, quote, in air quotes, or improve these conditions is through drugs. So I just want to point out right off the bat that this modality is a completely different approach because we're looking at the body itself, looking at the alignment and placement of the uterus and actually interacting with the body in a very physical way. I just wanted to know if either of the two of you would like to speak on that because I think it's really important just to get that across, especially for women who've been struggling with issues and really feel like there is no other alternative. I have to take Signal. Oh, oh. Had a plumb going on between the brain and is from the brain are they're in the blood. And if there's something that's preventing that plumbing from working perfectly, whether it's um, a lot of internal scar tissue, adhesions, inflammation, I mean, these are physical structures. And if something is pressing up against something, it's going to, re- it's just not going to flow, right? It's just, and and in the body, all this plumbing lies right up against your muscles to push off the blood flow, right? So, you know, that's kind of like one way that I can explain it. And again, it's not going to happen quickly, but the idea is that the, the, your body is the wisdom. And, and it knows how to come into balance as long as you have no obstructions 
of blood, as Rosita talked about, arterial, venous, lymph, nerve, innervations, and chi. And that's just a hard thing because culturally we're just, we're just too disconnected. So what Don is talking about, again, is homeostasis and hemodynamics. You must have proper hemodynamics, dynamic, unimpeded blood flow in order to have homeostasis, which is balance within. And we give thanks for them when we need them. But as an alternative physician who's been involved in natural healing with women for 42 years, I know that often what we should always try, not often, but always try the natural way first. If it doesn't assist, if it's not working, then it's time to go for the big guns. But also people need to be aware that they often do not do what they're to fix. So they're necessary at times, and we're grateful for them also. But I don't think that it should be the first call. I think my teacher, Don Alicio, always said it's only natural to go to a doctor after natural herbal remedies and massage has not helped. So that's my take on that. We're grateful for the drugs, but I don't think it should be the first response. And it's also not one thing that fixes something. You know, our bodies are integrated. It's there. We have we have a physical level, emotional, mental, and spiritual, and all of those are involved in in your healing process and your health. Right. Right. And the drugs address the chemistry basically, yeah. and there is so much more going on than the chemistry of the body. Mm-hmm. Well, I love the description of the plumbing. I had to have a little chuckle because again, it's exactly what you said. We're so disconnected from our bodies that we don't even understand. We talk about hormones all day long, right? Hormones this, hormones mm-hmm. that. How does the hormone get there? Through the blood. Exactly what you said. And I think mm-hmm. for a lot of people, that was a really important aha moment because mm-hmm you could have a problem where it's showing up on labs and all this kind of stuff. And it could quite literally be an issue with the flow of blood to your actual ovary and not none of the medications that you put in your mouth or, you know, supplements are necessarily going to take care of that physical issue. And the, the ovarian arteries and veins in females and the testicular arteries and veins in males lie right along the psoas muscle. And the psoas muscle is the muscle of the soul. It's your muscle of fight or flight. And in men, in most of us have very tight psoas muscles. And, and there you go. You've got an imbalance in the making. And there's something else that you said a little bit earlier regarding how you talk about Arvigo and how it helps. So instead of, be, you know, being, you mentioned being very careful, care, careful, I just made up a word, but being very careful about how you talk about it in terms of like, are you doing this to speed up the pregnancy or are you doing it as a way to kind of align and heal the body right. and the cycle and those systems? And then what happens afterwards? So right. this brings us to the study that you did. I'd love to hear more about it. So from what I was looking over two of the kind of main outcomes that you were paying attention to were the cervical fluid as well as the luteal phase, uh, which as Dr. Avigo mentioned, are obviously both crucial uh, Mm -hmm. to natural conception. But share with us just a little bit about, so, you know, the participants and also what you actually did. So kind of take us through what it is that you were doing for how long and then how you are measuring these effects. Okay. So I wanted to track a group of 10 people for a period of four to five months. And I wanted to first, in the first month, the approach was to get a baseline of what their cycle looked like. Now, cycle, it was just on a daily basis. This wasn't any really specific method that I was using, just what are the days that you're bleeding, I told them, gave them some parameters about looking at cervical fluid and mark those down on those days. And then, oh, by the way, if you're experiencing any other, any signs, pain, breast tenderness, moodiness, urine leakage, pain during intercourse, and just had them add that. And those are all things that as an Arvigo practitioner that we always ask our clients anyway. So, and then 
they would come see me the next month after they got their, their, when their period came again, and then they would receive a professional, I would review their chart with them. They'd receive a professional session from me. I would teach them the self care. And then they'd come at least two more months after that. And some people, they came for three more months. So some of these people I was tracking as long as five months and I had five cycles. So in any kind of study, you really want to remove bias as much as possible. Just the fact that people are attracted to, to me and the work that I do is introducing some bias. And I was aware of that. So I just very put it out there on Facebook. Hey, I'm doing this study. Contact me. So I wasn't just out there amongst my friends. I told everybody. And then I had a set of criteria. You know, I want basically, you've got to be willing to learn this. I need to know that you are not trying to conceive at this time. You're not taking any medications. You're going to let me know if you're sick. You're going to, you know, and so try to reduce all possible things that could get into this and not make any big diet changes. And so in that way, I try to reduce bias as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So that was how I, you know, recruited the people. And out of those 10, I eventually it took me several months. It took me about four months. And I probably say maybe 40 people contacted me. And so out of that, it was 10 that met the criteria and nine of them completed the study to four months and some went even to five months. And so when you were describing it, it sounds like it would be, well, so did they have kind of one initial session with you, like a physical session? Yes. Yes. So and then you taught them the self-care. So the study kind of mirrors what an actual client interaction would look like. Oh, yes, yes. But they, it was only the self-care massage. We weren't doing anything. Um, I wasn't doing uh, castor oil packs. We weren't doing no supplements. No, there was nothing else that was going on. It was just, and I wanted them to minimize any, as much as possible, anything else, or to let me know if they were. So the first month was charting your cycle, bring it in. Let's make sure you know what you're doing. The second month was receive a, an hour session from me, learn the self-care, continue to track your cycle. The third month, receive an hour session from me, continue the self-care. And we did that for several months. And, and we would look at and talk about the changes and how things were going. Okay. So they had like a monthly session with you and then yes. between sessions, they were doing the self-care. Yes. Um, one of the questions, because of course I'm, a, you know, educator, so I'm curious about the mucus, and you probably talked about it in the study. But when they were tracking mucus, were you just tracking the number of days of mucus, or were you tracking the type and how many times per day? How were you doing that? I had them check their cervical mucus every day when they stopped bleeding, and they were the particular criteria that I was looking at was any part of it. How did it feel when they wiped? Was it slippery? And if they could pick something off the toilet paper, was any part of it clear and or did it stretch greater than an inch? So those are the cr criteria that I was looking at. Okay. So just so that I'm understanding, it's exciting. But yeah, so you, you basically had these participants, they were going through our Vigo, they were seeing you in person monthly, they were doing their self-care and you did your best to minimize any other factors. So you had conversations with them about other things like castro you mentioned or whatever the case is. Like, did you talk or about vaginal steaming, but none of it was done. Okay. So that none they, of that was done. So the, the goal was to measure just only the abdominal therapy and if it could have any impact on the cycle itself. Right. I, I, I felt it was important to, I mean, from in a global perspective and not just focusing on our Vigo therapy does abdominal pelvic massage improve reproductive health mm -hmm. without the other things, just that. So you're right. It wasn't a full integrated RVGO session because we would be talking about castor oil packs and diet and vaginal steaming and, and things like that. So, and can um, I interject, Donna? It has always been a stumbling block for us because we do the abdominal massage. We uh, give, recommend the uh, vaginal steams. We recommend some uh, emotional, spiritual components for the people to undertake, sometimes a dietary change. And so all of the, there were always too many factors in right. our treatment. 
And the rainforest remedies, yeah. the rainforest remedies also. too, Rosita, right? Are the right. herbal mm-hmm. formulations, right? Herbal formulas, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So and Donna narrowing it down simply to the abdominal massage made the study possible. Yeah, because that's definitely a lot of factors. And then yeah. the question, too many, too many for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it would be an interesting. See, this is the thing. If we had unlimited money, like if our <laughs> Vigo therapy was a drug that you could like. <laughs> right? Then you have all of this stuff happening. And this is one of the challenges. This is one of the challenges in this space in our patriarchal world. Whenever you have a a natural therapy that doesn't have research behind it, I think sometimes people forget that the absence of research does not mean that a thing hasn't been, doesn't work. It means that there is no research yet. There's a difference. That's correct. That's correct. (laughs) Or or that it it doesn't fit those stiff parameters. All right. You know, nat- natural healing and those who develop the uh, original double-blind studies and all of that, it uh, was never meant to fit into this paradigm, the, mm-hmm. the paradigm of alternative natural therapies. Mm-hmm. It was meant well, to fit in drugs. Research itself is not infallible. It's something that I've spoken about as well mm-hmm. because... Yes. When you're doing research, all researchers have bias no matter how much they try not mm-hmm. to. Right. Um, and yep. you can have different people looking at the same data and outcome, like the same numbers, and come to different mm-hmm. conclusions about what those things mean. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have huge companies that conduct multiple studies on drugs that they are incentivized financially to mm-hmm. promote. And mm-hmm. if you've got, you know, if you do 30 research studies and five of them show really negative results, you may never see those five. So I think we, we always, like, we have to be adults and have our heads on when it comes to research. One practical question that I have for you, because you also measured the luteal phase length in your study, is how are you confirming ovulation and how are you calculating that luteal phase length? And I think that that's probably, if I were to say the one part of the study that if I were to do it again, I would do differently, is that I wasn't confirming ovulation. So that's the... I was looking at where there was a drop off and getting at the peak day, the last day of any kind of high fertility cervical mucus, and then measuring it from there to, yeah. to when they started to bleed again. And I didn't confirm ovulation. You're right. Yeah, and that would, have, that would have been done like I would have had to do the basal body temperature, I think would have helped, or o- OPK or something to confirm that. Well, actually, that doesn't even confirm it either. So... Right. Well, there, it's, that's interesting that you say that because when you look at a lot of the the, the studies that exist mm-hmm. regarding the menstrual cycle that discuss luteal phase length, there are many studies that actually do use the ovulation predictor kit and the the increase in luteinizing hormone as a way to confirm ovulation, which is ironic. Mm-hmm. So the I mean the most there's two mm-hmm. ways that are like the most scientific, right? The daily mm-hmm. ultrasound and also the blood draw to confirm mm-hmm. progesterone. But, right. but anyways, we don't need to pick everything apart. I'm just curious. And of course, yeah. as you know, my listeners are going to want to know that. So, yeah. so, um, so tell us what so, happened. So again, you know, and it was being doing this work for almost 10 years now yeah, and you're tracking the clients are, that I work with because I'm teaching them a bit about their cycle, not into any crate. It's, basically for observing and tracking, not really to necessarily to conceive or to avoid, but you know, how valuable is the therapy that you're receiving? It's a great way as a practitioner to, to make that statement to your clients and get them involved in their hearing, healing and seeing the value. But you would hear, man, my cervical mucus, I had so much of it this month after I've been doing this session. I can't, you know, it's so different. And it's, it's been like that since I've been working with you or man, my, and people who have been working and, and are using OPKs and everything and trying to conceive my luteal phase is longer now. I, I can see it. It's, it's longer. So in the study, I, it wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't confirming it, but you know, you have the anecdotal evidence from years and years of working with clients telling you that. And so, you know, the journeys and healing book that, that you interviewed Diane McDonald and I some, you know, some time ago on, um, you know, is, it is evidence. It is research. It's anecdotal, clinically-based case studies. Um, so and, babies, sure. and babies to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> and babies, there you go. Babies to prove babies, it. Babies to prove it. You know, but, you know, there was a, 
what's circulating around now a lot amongst our practitioners, those that work with clients that are for experiencing fertility challenges, was an editorial that was written in the International Journal of Therapeutic Massage and Body Work in 2018 by Sarah Fogarty, where she says, fertility massage, an unethical practice. And in it, she talks about... Unethical? How can Unethical, we- that there's is no research out there. Is it unethical to get a there. back massage? There's, there's nothing <laughs> in there to not call it that, to not call it that. And that was another thing that really inspired me. She says, there's no evidence linking Dr. Abdominal, Jennifer Mercier, abdominal, right. hmm? <laughs> just what? to put it out there, it's not yeah. our Vigo, but Dr. Jennifer Mercier has concluded studies in this, in a similar vein. Mm-hmm. And again, this is, this is one of the challenges that you have to highlight. I mean, neither Dr. Jennifer Mercy nor you and Dr. Arvigo, unless I'm wrong, so you correct me, have access to like multiple tens of millions of dollars to do these gigantic clinical studies. So there are very real barriers to having this very important research done. I think that it's really important and we're going to see more of it as more women come into the health space to actually do these types of grassroots studies. Obviously, it's not the same caliber as a double-blind placebo-controlled mm-hmm. trial with all the money and all the participants, but mm-hmm. this is the beginning, and you can build on these studies, right, as more interest and more funding comes along. So it's, we can't just say, oh, we have to throw it all out. It doesn't mean anything. We have to take those steps, and then we can always build on them in the future and improve the studies and all of that as we come. Right. So let me tell you about some, uh, some of the results. First off, this the study doing a study like this was feasible. I had high participation and it, and adherence to the inclusion criteria and to the self care massage. I'd say that you know on, on average they were doing it like at least a minimum every other day of their cycle, which you know yeah, that's that's good. None of us are we're not all great at self care. So up to, up to me that I think that is a nice nice that that was accomplished saw improvements in cervical mucus quality and duration of days in the cycle where it was observed that the high the higher fertility again the the luteal phase length there was some indication it's questionable but there was some indication and because i was open to outcome and we were tracking a variety of signs what what really also shown very strongly was less painful menstruation less painful periods less dark blood during their cycles. And we know that, you know, the brighter, the, bright, the dark blood isn't quite healthy. It's old blood it's, and less clots. And so to me, that was really important and really showing about how the work is improving reproductive health signs. Mm-hmm. And some of it, there was less leakage of urine, less, less painful intercourse, but those weren't as, these were small numbers that I was working with. So the statistical analysis that I did was, was I applied a t-test to gauge the statistical significance of small sample size and the probability that the changes that I was observing were not by chance. So would need, of course, bigger numbers to, to improve, but this, these were really, they really stuck out there. So to, to summarize, more, more <laughs> higher quality cervical mucus for a longer period of, num- of days in the cycle, less period pain and less dark blood. Well, and so... Obviously, we are discussing very openly and honestly the limitations of the study. So for anyone who's listening, who's like, that's not statistically uh, significant, Mm -hmm. like we we are acknowledging and discussing the limitations (laughs) openly, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, And just let me me just interject there, Lisa, that Donna undertook this on her own, on her own, with no funding no backing of any organization. We certainly were happy and supported it in the Arvigo Institute, but any other study that would be all conclusive would involve, as you mentioned, probably millions of dollars and some grand big institute behind it, which we are not. We're a small organization, and I think Donna did a really fabulous contribution for all of us. Well, I think, well, I appreciate that, of course. It's incredible. And I really think, as I was saying earlier, like, I feel like this is what is going to continue happening because what else can we do in an age where everyone is demanding science? 
if we don't have the massive money and the massive institute to back us, we're going to have to start doing this on our own in the hopes that this is going to stimulate the, the research that we so de- desperately need. What I feel is very interesting about your study is that I would not have, I mean, so in my practice, it's obviously not the same. I don't do our Vigo therapy, but I work with the menstrual cycle and I have been for years and years and years. And so it's clear to me when you look at the cycle parameters that when you make subtle shifts in your you know, diet, lifestyle, and also uh, you know, many of my clients will do pieces of ab- abdominal massage therapy and things like that, you see improvements. But my first initial thought wouldn't be, oh, our Vigo is going to improve your mucus or our Vigo is going to improve your luteal phase. So obviously this is a bit of conjecture, which is a good, I think for everybody, when you have a research study and then you have these results, as the researcher, you're the one that has to come up with the conclusion and provide your hypothesis as to why this is, and that would stimulate further study. Like, is this actually the reason why this is happening? So based on your experience, your training, your history, and then also your participation in conducting the study, why do you feel that these results were what happened? Like, how does abdominal therapy potentially improve mucus production or improve luteal phase length? I know we've spoken about it a bit previously, but I feel like we can hash it out a little bit more. I think it improves the the quality of the plumbing. <laughs> Rosita, I'm going to right. turn that over well, to you. You know, uh, when we when we do it again, if we start in the upper <laughs> abdomen, the blood supply from from the from the uh, thorax comes from the heart, goes through the uh, goes through the diaphragm muscle, which again is the seat of anxiety, tension, fear, worry. And then it gets very tight and it actually squeezes that abdominal aorta so that there is lessened amount of oxygenated hormone rich blood moving downward into the pelvic organs. So we begin there and we loosen that. And that's where we find so much emotional tension. That's why our work is both physical, emotional, and we even delve into the spiritual with our Maya spiritual healing if we feel it's necessary. So when we improve the blood flow, I know we keep saying that again and again, but that's everything. It's homeostasis and hemodynamics. The body and the brain know what to do. They are, they're set, they're programmed, they're divine machines. They know exactly how to perform, but if they're not getting the proper nutrients, then they cannot do what was intended to be done. I always liken it to a garden. I'm an avid gardener. And when you allow, uh, if you're irrigating your little garden and the water comes flowing in, but it doesn't reach the bottom beds, you know that those beds above where they're getting proper water flow are going to be excellent producers. They're going to be thriving big green leaves or whatever it is you're growing. And then as the water trickles and the flow isn't proper going downward at the very bottom, you may have a sprout that lasts for a a week or two, and then it dries up and dies. And that's what's happening into the ovary. They're not drying up and dying. I don't mean to make that analogy. But if it's not getting sufficient blood supply and that artery that goes to the ovary actually is right under the diaphragm. So if the diaphragm is holding tension, and everybody's does, nobody's diaphragm doesn't hold tension. (laughs) That's just the way we're made. Then the amount of blood getting into it, and then add the fact that the uterus can be misaligned. Sometimes it's actually laying on top of the ovary, ovary if it's over to the side. So there are these multiple factors that come into play, the blood supply and the alignment of the organs, which is exactly what we address. So this is, you know, a drug-free approach to normalization of body function. And we, we firmly believe that normalization of fertility is one of the primary signs of health within the body. Mm -hmm. That's why we say, Baby is the second prize. Return to normal state of well-being and prime health is the first prize. Mm -hmm. Did I answer that question for you? (laughs) 
I just wanted to pop in to today's episode with a quick message from today's sponsor, Audible. Did you know that you can listen to The Fifth Vital Sign for free when you sign up for a 30-day trial with Audible? Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash audible for details. That's fertilityfriday.com slash audible. Now let's jump back into today's episode. And it's, it's not all just about the massage. It's also about making healthy, other healthy choices. You can't have really, really bad diet and be drinking a lot of alcohol and, and do the, the massage saying, well, I'm doing the massage. It's going to work, right? So, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, I think one of the, the big takeaways for myself that I'm going to take away from our conversation is that very visual because I love connecting women to their physical bodies since it's just, even in the work that I do, when I talk about how to, you know, how to describe and to feel the change in your cervical position, it's your whole uterus that moves, like it it Mm -hmm. shifts position. So your cervix can tilt backwards or be down, you know, straight. And that is a concept that none of us are, even though we, you know, walk around with uterus, uteri inside our body, we don't really understand that they're dynamic and that they move throughout the Mm -hmm. cycle. And so when we're talking about blood flow, like say it, say it again louder for the people in the back. When we're talking about <laughs> blood flow, flow, that is how your hormones get to where they need to go. Like it's right. not magic. And I love what you said. You're like, it's not Wi-Fi. They <laughs> have to go through the plumbing. And so that is, I, I feel like that's a really interesting hypothesis. This mm-hmm. is a really interesting place for future research. Mm-hmm. You know, does just addressing the physical body and improving the blood flow and improving alignment, does that improve the ability of our hormones to really mm-hmm. transport? You know, does that change how our body can function? And very, very, just a, an amazing concept to really look at. And, you know, and the massage is also improving uh, not the mobility of the structures too, right? And in so many ways, things can get just stuck in our bodies and not moving, whether you call it scar tissue, adhesions, inflammation. And when you look at the process of conception and, and what's happening in, in the oviducts and the egg tubes and, and how the sperm is moving and how the egg is moving. You know, if things aren't moving on at, my, at a macroscopic level, it's unlikely that they're moving at a microscopic level, right? Mm-hmm. So, so many things have to, that whole ability to move and the, the uterus being able to contract the way it needs to and flow during different times of the cycle, that the abdominal yeah, just, pelvic yeah. massage is going to help that as well. Look at the fallopian tube at, at the moment of conception. The fallopian tube has to bring the, uh, the egg from the ovary downward and bring the sperm upward at the same time. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is a tremendous engineering feat. And it is very well designed to do that if all the other parameters are just normal. That's all, just normal. Opti- normal is optimum. And so the ovary and the uterus has to have that flexibility to move. And even function of the orgasm has to do with movement and contraction of the uterus. And of course, the uterus has to move in pregnancy. It has to move in labor and delivery. So the uterus is an organ that is intended intended and meant to be um, moved, to move throughout the body. It has to. Mm-hmm. Well, and I'd like to talk a little bit about pain. Recently, I've been posting a lot of interesting things on Instagram, and a lot of very interesting conversations have come out of it. And what I find, and I've alluded to this already, but what I find, especially for, it's really women, because I'm one of them, I've had a lot of pain over my life with menstruation. And when I was like I wish where where were you 20 years ago <laughs> Dr. Arby, right, right lots of people say that because yeah. Yeah. when I was a teenager it was really bad so I have a lot mm-hmm. of empathy and understanding firsthand understanding mm-hmm. of how ridiculously painful periods can be and I, I think it was in one of my interviews with Dr. Laura Bryden she was like when you describe your pain I can't help but wonder if you had a touch of endo and we'll never know but it was like for me it was that bad so when women are talking about their pain and really and truly women who experience extreme pain, they really are at the point where they feel that they have no options. 
you know, they've been to the doctor multiple times in many cases, if they're experiencing extreme pain, they've taken painkillers, some of which work, some of which don't work. They've been put on the pill. And for many women, that has been the only thing that has ever helped. And for some women, even that doesn't help as much as they would like it to. And many women have gone through multiple surgeries and like still, you know what I mean? So I just want to talk a bit about pain and between the two of you, your years of experience working with women with different challenges, if you could share a little bit about maybe some of the women who you've worked with that did have extreme pain and what, if for the listener who's in that category, who's been basically told there's nothing she can do or is under the impression that it is just a normal thing to have pain and it's just a normal part of being a woman, share with us a little bit about how our Vigo can help bring us back to that quote unquote normal optimal place where... Right. Okay. Well, Lisa, I was in practice for 42 years and in Belize in Central America, sometimes in, in, in and around the Chicago area during those 42 years. And my practice was primarily women of the Mennonite community who have as many as 18 children. So we're all about menstruation and fertility in my practice. And I can say that across the board, all of our practitioners around the world, one of the most reliable responses that we know will occur is reduction of menstrual pain. Now, if we separate those who have endometriosis from those who have simply uh, menstrual difficulties or dysmenorrhea not related to a actual medical condition, we see it again. We're right back to hemodynamics. There, the substance in the body, the prostaglandins, flow through the bloodstream and get to the uterine muscle, and they allow the muscle to contract and relax in a matter in a manner that is minimally painful. In our practice, we tell our clients that any more than 30 minutes of mild discomfort is pathology in the menstrual cycle. And across the board, we see that as one of the most reliable improvements in our clientele. So going from days of miserable pain and maybe not being able to go to work to no pain, it does require that often there is what we refer to as the uterine lavage. Those people who have painful menstruation and they see dark blood at the beginning of their cycle dark blood at the end of the cycle, or they see a lot of clots, those people have, from our point of view, a congested uterus. That's where the abdominal massage is very helpful because it begins to help the uterine muscle begin to move more efficiently. Then we introduce the vaginal steam to do the the entrance of, to get the heat into the cervix and get the essential oils present in the plant working, and it's like we refer to it as like Brillo on the uterine membrane to clean that. So often the first cycle is minor or no improvement, but there is always this evidence of this uterine flush, a uterine lavage. The word uh, comes from the Latin lavar, to wash. The second cycle Almost always, if we put a percentage, we don't have we don't have the data, but I know from 42 years of practice, 90% of the time, the second cycle, the pain has been reduced dramatically. By the third cycle, there is no pain. How many clients have come to me and said, I didn't even know my period came until I felt it flow? And that was the woman who used to have two days of painful periods. So again, it's not every single client who's going to have those dramatic results, but it is so often that we are, you know, we're kicking our heels and patting each other on the back and so grateful to the traditional healers who taught us, taught me this, this, um, this massage that I could pass on to others. So this is something that's been with women since ancient days. And everywhere I travel around the world, if I talk to grandmothers or aunties, they are all aware that at some point in their history, there was a massage for uterine problems. So this is, this is a, a, um, aspect of women's health that has always been with us, but was forgotten. I have a textbook from 1910, a medical textbook with a whole chapter on uterine displacement. 
you no longer find it in medical texts. It's considered old-fashioned medicine that is now irrelevant. Mm-hmm. Well, it, I mean, it, there's, a, there's a few things that, of course, come to mind. I mean, again, this is a different modality. This is a different way of dealing with it. It, it seems as though with Western medicine, as soon as with, you know, with the advent of painkillers, then we don't really look at the body anymore. Even if a woman is, because I've experienced it, it's a very physical <laughs> experience to feel right. menstrual pain. It, it hurts. Yes, it is. And it hurts in a specific yes. place. And it often That's throbs right. and pulls and right. contracts. Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. Having gone through labor twice, I can Mm -hmm. confidently say that period pain is much more annoying because it just lasts all day, right? Like it just, right. Whereas with when you're like, it depends on the labor, everyone's labor is different. So in some cases with labor, you have these contractions, but first of all, it feels like you're doing it for a reason because you're having a baby. And also it's not necessarily this constant pain all the time. So again, a different way of looking at it, we're looking at this as a physical thing. And something else that you mentioned earlier, it's kind of like, well, if you have these issues, this is kind of like one of the first things that you can do. And then if it doesn't work, we still have all of the medical options. It's not one or the right. other. There's, th- right. there, there's no rule that says, <laughs> says mm-hmm. that it's one or the other. I, I received criticism from a certain small percentage of um, individuals for making a, a bold statement that the pill doesn't treat, fix, or cure anything especially a huge backlash from women who experience period pain because for a lot of women, the, the, the drugs, the, the pill is the only thing that has ever provided relief. So again, there's nothing wrong with it because no one should be in pain. Do exactly what yeah. that you need to do. I just feel that there's a percentage of those women who potentially someday want to have children mm-hmm. or just want to not have to be on medication for the rest of their lives. And mm-hmm. I think that with a modality like this, when you're actually addressing the physical part of the body, it's Mm -hmm. different because we're actually saying, okay, what is actually wrong? And we're trying to... Yes, the issue is we we do our best to address the cause. Yeah. Drugs and surgery address the symptom. And that's always been the baseline difference between modern conventional medicine and what we consider traditional healing, Right. So we address the cause, the drugs address the symptom. Well, and I just thought of a question that I've never asked before. So for a woman who is kind of at the end of her rope, she's been on the pill for a long time. That's been the only thing that has given her relief. I mean, would she be able to undergo something like our Vigo therapy and all the different facets and forms while on the pill? You know what I mean? Like address some of these things. So she's not just coming off the pill to all this pain. Yeah, well, you know, every human being is unique. We have a 10-page uh, intake form that we ask people to, to fill out. And it's, it's very lengthy, but we have to know so many parameters and so many factors before I could give you that answer. But I have treated many hundreds of women on the pill. Yes, of course, we can treat them if they're on the pill. And um, if they're on the pill for pain gradually they make the decision themselves to begin waning off. And if they're on the pill not to to achieve pregnancy, that's a different story. But yes, the answer, the short answer is yes, definitely. I have treated patients like that. And with with success, 100% of the time, no, because often there are other issues that we can't see externally. We can't feel or we can't see externally. So we never make the claim that our approach is 100% effective, but we are so effective that uh, even we are astounded, and that's why we're talking to you. Mm-hmm. Now, some of the most substantial healing that I saw happen with some of my clients that had really, I mean, really, like flat out for, for two, three days in bed period pain, and mm-hmm. we work together, and I always tell them, you know, that natural healing does take time and that your symptoms can temporarily get worse before they get better because the body is good stuff is going in through the plumbing, but the plumbing is also taking the, the, the old stuff and not so good stuff out. Right. So that can cause a, a detox reaction or something. So 
often I, uh, the, at the next cycle, and I warn them, I said, you, it may be the, the period from hell, right? It might even be worse. And the, the most improved clients I see are those that that second cycle is like hell. And then subsequent cycles like that, it's all uphill from there. It, it gets so much better. You know, that's where the most significant healing has happened place when, when, when you really physically observe the cleansing that's happening. Well, traditionally, that's known as the healing crisis. Right, yeah. And every effective natural therapy modality usually includes a healing crisis where it looks like it's getting better, getting worse before it gets better. Mm-hmm. So we always talk about, you know, give, give this three months before you say you're not seeing any improvements because um, on average, the time that it takes for a cell to replenish in the body is three months on mm-hmm. average. I'm glad we were able to spend some time talking about pain because I, I mean, it's very important. And every now, every now and then, and whenever I work with clients and also in my Facebook community, I will, you know, every now and then just ask about pain. And a lot of women experience pain with menstruation and in a, yes, a, a lot of, a lot of the time mm-hmm. it's quite significant. So this isn't just yeah. a minor issue. This is something, and a lot of oh. women are at the point where they've just accepted it because now you, you're grown up and you've always had some pain with it and you've just accepted it as normal and, and whatever, and you just live your life. And even though you're going to rate the pain as a five or six or seven out of 10, for you, that's just normal and it's just what you deal with and whatever. And so I think it's really important to have these conversations just to put it out there because still for a lot of women, when I say period pain might be really common, but it's not normal and it's not a sign of health and it's a sign that there's a problem. A lot of women are still kind of astounded by that because they're just like, well, I just always thought it was normal for it to be painful. And I just thought it was normal to have to take Advil for a couple of days every time I got my period. Mm-hmm. Exactly right. It, it is common, but it is not normal. Any more than 30 minutes of mild discomfort is pathology and can be corrected with natural modalities in most cases. Well, so going back to the study, so we've talked about three of kind of the main outcomes that you saw, which again are very interesting. And just for me, I think like, man, further research. So the cervical fluid, the improvement in that, the lengthening of the luteal phase, and then the improvement of pain. You know, as we bring our call to a close, because of course I could just talk to the two of you for the rest of the day, but at some point, I'm sure that we have to get back to what we're doing for the rest of the day. What does this mean for women? So what are the, after kind of going through and doing this work with these women, after summarizing the results and creating your report and having time to really sit with it and think about it, what does this mean for women So for the women who are listening to this podcast right now, like what are the implications for moving forward? Hmm. You know, I was thinking a bit about the the testimonials. I don't know if you had a chance to read them, Lisa, but the, because each of the people that participated in the study wrote about what it meant to them, you know, learning about their bodies, the, the, the process of, of integrating the charting, um, you know, because you're not observing something, you're not aware of something if you're not observing it. And so becoming a more active participation in your health by tracking, by learning more about your body, learning about the plumbing and that it's not Wi-Fi and tracking your cycles and the key indicators is such an important part of the healing as well. And I'll, I'll even, I, I will even think about just the learning of the charting in itself, what role did that play in the healing of these people? <laughs> right? I, I mean, really. I wonder that because they say mm-hmm. anything that you monitor improves. And just by monitoring your cycle, I mean, if you're actually tracking and you're writing things down, you start doing other stuff. You start eating a little better. You start yeah. Eating a little better. They're drinking a bit more water. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> it's hard. This, this is why this type of research is very hard and it's very hard to be objective. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, also with the self-care massage that you're taught, you're doing a little something good for yourself every day. What role did that play in all of this, right? Well, and the placebo effect is very real. I mean, it is. Over the past however many hundreds of years that we've been doing studies, the scientists have inadvertently been proving how incredible yeah. the power of the mind is. Because when they do those double blind placebo controlled trials, you just, I mean, the way that they discuss it in research studies is by not talking about it. 
right? Uh So you'll see this like, uh oh, there was a 40% improvement in this. And then you do the (laughs) compare to the control and the control had a 20% improvement. And so really there was only a net 20% improvement with whatever the thing is. 20% That's a great point, Lisa. Yeah, all- That's a very good point. I've had my head in a lot of research, as you know, with writing the book and everything. And it's just so ever-present, the placebo effect. So- Mm -hmm. This well, may I interject again on the, on the Donna study and the result that when women are able to observe that their body inner workings can almost spontaneously improve, it really builds faith and it builds confidence in, in the entire physiological system in which you live. And you recognize that your body can heal itself. Your body can regulate itself, heal itself reorganize and heal it's able it's set up to do all of that and when you actually see evidence in black and white on paper that you yourself have recorded Mm -hmm. i just think it's uh tremendously encouraging for women to be able to see that Mm -hmm. so the message is you know step up get involved get informed and become empowered i understand what's going on be be an active participant in your health Yes. Yes. I find that especially in a world that's so negative when it comes to our bodies and our menstrual cycles, I just saw an advertisement saying something like, I'm paraphrasing because I don't have it in front of me. It was like your uterus wants to make babies. So when you don't make babies, then your uterus wants revenge. And that's why you have period pain. I was so annoyed when I read that. So anyone who read the same thing knows where it came from. I'm not going to call out who posted it or whatever. But I was just like, what? Like the last thing we need is more negativity. But what you said was so powerful because it's true. And I see this all the time. And that's why I'm still so passionate about this work, you know, decades in. But it's that when as a woman, you see that you can do something that can actually improve your cycle and your your experience of menstruation and your fertility and your health, when you start to see that the things that you do can have an impact, it changes you forever. And it, 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 mm-hmm. it changes the conversation from having this negative interaction with your body and thinking that it's betraying you and that it's screwing around with you and that why is it causing me so much pain and this is so unfair to actually starting to understand that, wow, this is a part of me and my body is actually very capable of taking care of me. That's right. Good point. Yep. All right. Well, any last thoughts, comments for the listeners, what you want them to take most from our conversation today? Donna? I don't have anything else. (laughs) <laughs> well, I, I would just like to say that the body is a magnificent, magnificent creation. The female body is able to reproduce, which is a divine, divine action, and that we are set up to do that. And if, if all of those mechanisms internally are not functionally optimum for you, that there are alternatives and we do not have to suffer. We do not have to be saddened or grieved by lack of fertility, that there are answers out there. And I just want to encourage everybody to find the cause, not treat the symptom. Perfect words to end on. Dr. Arvigo, Dada Zubra, thank you so much for being here. I could have stayed in this conversation all day. It was wonderful. Um, Me too. (laughs) Please tell us, so each of you take a, a moment, but please tell us uh, where we can go and find more information about you, your programs, your services, what's happening with each of you. Okay, well, our, uh, our Vigo Institute website is www.arvigotherapy.com where you can find all of the trainings and programs that are available to uh, people who are not uh, therapists, who are not in the body work profession. We have uh, weekends available for lay people, if you will. And uh, my website is rositaarvigo.com. And Donna? Sevengenerationswellness.com. Okay. And Donna, you have a program coming up. Did you want to tell us a little bit about it? Oh, yes. I'm working with another birth doula in the area, and we are putting together an education series 
where the You Can Do It doulas, and it's all about providing education to inform and, and empower you and your uterus. So it's going to be about pain, how to have a physiological birth, pain, how to manage pain during pregnancy, and I'm going to be doing a sex ed for grown-ups where I'm going to be doing an introduction to <laughs> the fifth vital sign and fertility awareness. So you can do it. You can do it. Love it. I do one more thing, Lisa. We really would like to erase the word infertility. It is a fertility challenge. Yes. Oh, yes. Love, love, love. Well, thank you so okay. much for being here. I will link everything that both Donna and Dr. Arvigo shared in the show notes page so you don't have to worry about writing it down if you're on the go. And thank you once again for being here. I know this episode is going to be, I know, <laughs> I know the listeners are really going to appreciate this episode and uh, it's quickly become one of my favorites. So thank you so much. Thank you too, Lisa. God bless. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it with a friend. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode over at fertilityfriday.com 284. I hope that you enjoyed today's interview with Dr. Rosita Arvigo and Donna Zubrod. It was just a treat having them on the show. And it, it was really, for me, you know, the last time I spoke to Dr. Arvigo was about four and a half or five years ago, you know, when right around the time the podcast was starting. So it was really nice to be able to interview her again. And when we finished our episode and we were talking in the pre-chat, I was just sharing with her how how much I appreciate learning from her. When you're speaking with her, you really get a sense of, you know, not only her expertise, but just the, the wisdom and experience that comes from decades of working with women and supporting women to heal in this particular way with this particular modality. And so I just want to say thank you once again for both of you for coming on the show. Uh, I always appreciate our conversations. And I know that for you as listeners, for the audience members, that there was a lot of eye-opening parts of this interview. I think that one of the things that really struck me during the, the interview was just how Dr. Arvigo was talking about blood flow. And it's just such a basic concept, but you don't really think about it. I always say we're very disconnected from our body. So we're not really thinking about the fact that the uterus is out of alignment or if the fallopian tubes aren't lined up properly or whatever the case is, if there are adhesions pre preventing proper movement, that it could physically inhibit blood flow and that could have a, a specific effect on your, your cycles because it could, you know, if, if the blood can't get to your organs, if you don't have unimpeded blood flow, then you're actually, those organs could not be getting the optimal amount of hormones just delivered to them. So from a very basic physical perspective, we always think, oh, if it's hormones, it has to be something that requires a supplement or something that requires a dietary change, or uh, it has to be related to something. We don't really think about something related to hormones being physical. And so again, that's why I really appreciate these abdominal therapy modalities, uh, just for, uh, especially for women who are struggling with whatever issue that you're struggling with, to know that there are other options that are less invasive that could potentially improve the root cause, the actual fundamental base of the issue, or at least together with other modalities, really address it. And so for women's healthcare, it reminds me of uh, my interview with Dr. Jennifer Mercier, because, you know, in that interview, what we were talking about was this should be standard healthcare for women before we jump to hormones and surgery and all of these very invasive practices why don't we just, you know, do a physical check to see if everything's in alignment, if everything's okay. It just seems so basic. And I hope that one day this becomes the standard of healthcare. So with that, I will say goodbye. I hope that you have a wonderful week, weekend, whenever you're listening to the podcast. I really appreciate all of you for sharing the show with your friends, for spreading the word about Fertility Friday. For any of you who have purchased and read the fifth vital sign i appreciate you so much and i would really appreciate it if you would you know hop over to amazon if you haven't had a chance and leave an honest review of the book the reviews of the book are one of the ways to 
really help women to find the book, to know if it's the right book for them and to know if this is really where they should be getting their information. So I appreciate all of you for being part of this movement. And if you do happen to leave a a review, make sure to tag me on social media with a picture or send an email. You never know what could happen. Uh, So with that, I will say goodbye. Thank you so much for tuning in today. And of course, as always, until next time, be well and happy charting. Thank you.